So today we, it's about uh, related to Christmas, okay? You'll see later. But first I want to start with some terrible predictions about future technology. Let's read some of them. The Americans have need of telephone, but we do not. We have plenty of messengers. A messenger boy, sorry. Sir William Priest. He predicted this in 1878. Was he right? This telephone has too many shortcomings to be seriously considered as a means of communication. The device is inherently of no value to us. Was he right in 1876? No. Let's read this one. A cellular phone will absolutely not replace local wire system. Was he right? Do you have cell, uh, cell phones? Or mobiles, yes. Okay, so this one was right. Oh, sorry, wrong. Next one. There is practically no chance communication space satellites will be used to provide better telephone, telegraph, television, or radio service inside the United States. That guy made fool of himself, didn't he? Rail travel at high speed is not possible because passengers unable to breathe will die of asphyxia. Was he right? It's ridiculous, isn't it? For us. Heavier than air, flying machines are impossible. Anybody works for Qantas here? No? Oh, the little boy here. Okay, good. <laughs> the other one is, I must confess that my imagination refuses to see any sort of submarine doing anything but suffocating its crew and floundering at sea. What do you think? Good predictions? Terrible predictions. Let's see this one. Television wouldn't last because people will soon get tired of staring a plywood box every night. <laughs> Why are you laughing so loud? <laughs> because it's very funny. Yes. Wow. Wrong predictions. Yes. Well, prophecy. What is prophecy? In the, according to the dictionary, it's a prediction of what will happen in the future. Someone says history is history written in advance. Let's see what the Bible says about some prophecy or let's say some future events. Okay. Remember the former things of all, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times, things that I not yet done, saying my counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. God is the only one that can reveal the end from the beginning. I don't know anybody else that can do that. Every time men try to uh, forecast even the weather, they get it wrong all the time, especially Melbourne. In Amos 3, 7 says, Surely the Lord God does nothing unless He reveals His secret to His servants, the prophets. Jesus said in, in John, And now I have told you before it comes. That when it does come to pass, you may believe. So he, he, uh, he always trying to tell us, the Bible always trying to tell us things from the beginning. So that when it happens, we can what? Believe. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation. Now this is really sad. I have friends from other religions. And they said they don't want to touch the book of Revelation because they can't understand and not even their parents and their parents and, you know. But is the book of Revelation for private interpretation? No? No. And so is the book of Daniel. So everything that is in the Bible is being revealed to us through the Bible, through the scriptures. For prophecy never come by the will of Men, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So there is a divine hand in the writings 
of the scriptures. The devil's biggest job is always trying to put doubts in our minds so that we can stop believing. And when we stop believing, then our heart walks away from the way of the Lord. So the purpose of prophecy then is to prepare the church for the future and to build confidence in the Bible. Do you want to see some of the predictions that are written in the Bible? Okay, since we are very close to Christmas, I thought it, it would be appropriate to talk about some of these. Old Testament prophecies about the birth of Jesus. Jesus was going to come from the, uh, from the seed of Abraham. Everybody knows who Abraham was? Yes? Okay, he was called the father of faith. And then today we know that two nations or two, um, well, Israel comes from them, from him, sorry, and the Arabs also, part of them, come from Abraham through his son. What was his name? Ishmael. So, in Genesis 22, 18 says, In your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed, because you have obeyed my voice. Is that, was it true, what the Bible says? That all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. By whom? Who was going to come from him? The Messiah. Otherwise, he would say through Israel. It says, all the nations. Jesus was going to come from the line of Jacob. Who was Jacob? Abraham's, Abraham's grand son. Come on, guys. You Bible, you started the Bible. You, you can interact with me. Okay. Uh, Numbers 24, 17 says, I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star shall come out of Jacob. A scepter shall rise out of Israel. Have you ever read this in the Bible? This Bible verse. Do you know who pronounced those words? Do you have an idea? Okay, Bible readers. He was a prophet. But this prophet sold his prophecy to another king who wasn't, that wasn't from Israel. His name, I'm, gonna tell, I'm not going to tell you the name, but a donkey spoke to him. Do you know his name? Balaam. When he was paid by uh, the king uh, Balak, he said, prophesy against Israel, please, and curse them. And which, which words came? This ones. in one of, the, uh, one of the time. Beautiful. Jesus was going to come from the line of Judah. And Judah was the son of Jacob. So he becomes the great-grandson of Abraham. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet. Until Shiloh, this is the word for Jesus Christ here, comes. And to him shall be the obedience of some people. What does it say? The obedience of the people. And that includes you and I. Jesus was going to come from the line of David. Does anybody know who David was? Yes? David was son of Jesse. And he is also on the line of Jesus. He will be like he was on the line of Abraham too, and he will be a great, 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 great grandfather of Jesus. So, do you know how many years was written this prophecy? Let's see. Jeremiah was um, alive about seven hundred and fifty to 800 years before Christ was born. So let's see. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that I will raise to David a branch of righteousness. A king shall reign and prosper and execute judgment and righteousness, righteousness in the earth. In his day, Judah will be saved and Israel will dwell safely. Now this is his name by which he will be called. The Lord, now, 
our righteousness. How beautiful is that? The Lord, our righteousness. From the prophet Isaiah, we know he was born from a virgin about 700 years before Christ. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Today we know that this was true because there were four Gospels written about the life of Christ. We know the first one was Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And the other apostles that got to know him, like Peter, testified of him. And he said in one of his letters, what we saw with our own eyes and what we touched with our own hands. About him, we preach, we talk about. From the prophet Micah, we know he was born into the tribe of Judah, in the region of Ephrata, in the, name, uh, sorry, in the town of Bethlehem. But you, Bethlehem, Ephrata, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from of all, from what? From ancient times. When Jesus revealed himself in the book of Revelation, what does he say? I am the one who was, who is, and who is to come. Let's sing a song.
Isaiah predicted that Jesus will die for our sins. But he was wounded for our transgressions. transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastise, chastisement for our peace was upon him. And by his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. It's probably one of the most beautiful messianic prophecies. If you read the whole chapter, chapter 53. And if you talk to a Jew, someone who doesn't believe in Jesus. This, is, this evidence is like, you know, it's like probably the biggest in the Bible about a Messiah. The other one is uh, Daniel chapter 9. But today we know Jesus died on the cross. A lot of people try to deny that Jesus didn't exist. Have you ever heard on radio or television? Yes? All right. One day I was on the radio and somebody was saying, Jesus didn't, it's not even a historical um, person. And he started giving his own argument. And then an atheist who was a, a professor in history, he said, we have more evidence about Jesus than any other historical individual. Even more than Abraham Lincoln. In fact, about the Gospels, it just, this is just uh, in, in the New Testament, we have about 5,635 uh, writings about Jesus Christ. And this is only in Greek. There's about 25,000 in different languages about Jesus Christ. Today, we don't have the originals, but we only have copies. And how do we know that what those gospels uh, talk about Jesus is because there were no writings against what they were saying. That means that when they came, the witnesses were still alive. So there's no writings that Jesus wasn't part of the Jewish community. So it's very interesting. David predicted that Jesus will have his hands and feet pierced. Now, do you know how many years was this prophecy um, predicted? 1,000 years. 1,000 years. One millennia. Let's see what it says. For dog has surrounded me. The congregation of the wicked has enclosed me. They pierce my hands and my feet. Do you know who invented crucifixion? The Romans. And Rome didn't even exist by then. In fact, crucifixion wasn't even invented yet. The Romans were masters in creating torture so they could actually really, really discourage people in a bad way. And they're the one, this, you know, when you, you, you sometimes people or women, especially when you have babies, you have a, baby, a pain that you say is excruciating. Where does the word coming from? From the crucifixion. David also predicted that Jesus' body will not see corruption. And I love this one. For you will not leave my soul in Sheol. The word Sheol didn't trust, wasn't translated on this version, but Sheol means graveyard or grave. Okay? So I'm going to read again. For you will not leave my soul in the grave, nor will you allow your Holy One to see what? Corruption. So, if Jesus would have, um, you know, not resurrected, Today we will know where his body is. Yes or no? Yes. Have, has anybody been to Israel? No one? Well, if you go there, you go to a, a place. I've never been there, but I've seen so many documentaries on it. But you go to the garden, okay, where today they say, you can walk, walk in it and there's no one there, no one body. Okay? And one of the scriptures says, He's not here because he is alive, risen or alive. 
It's beautiful. If all the messianic prophecies have been fulfilled in Jesus, can we trust other prophecies in the Old Testament about future events? What do you think? Yes? Okay, let's see. Joel predicted that he will see Jesus again when he comes. Do you know who wrote the book of Joel today? The um, professors in theology, they said that it was written by Moses. We don't really know the author, but in the way it was written, it's very similar to the writings of Moses. So this writing was 1,500 years in advance written about Jesus Christ. And this is about his second coming. For I know that my, can you say the word? Redeemer lives and he shall stand at last on the earth. And after my skin is destroyed, that in my flesh I shall see whom? God, whom I shall see for myself. And my eyes shall behold him. And not another, how my heart yearns within me. What beautiful writings about the second coming of Christ. Do you, do you feel like Job? Like after seeing what happened in the last three years with COVID. Don't you wish that Christ, Christ would come tomorrow or today? Like I wish he would come today. Really. When I read these Bible verses, man, I want to be there. Daniel predicted that Jesus will come to establish his kingdom forever. About 600 years before Christ. And in the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed and the kingdom shall not be left to other people who is he talking about the coming of christ beautiful prophecy it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms and he shall stand forever who is speaking those words daniel to whom king nebuchadnezzar a beautiful dream. It was a beautiful dream. And what a privilege for him that God reveals him the future. Daniel also predicted that Jesus will bring to life those who are sleeping. So is any, are you all Seventh-day Adventists? Do we have any visitors from other denominations? Do we have any visitors from other denominations? Don't be shy. Okay, we believe that when we die, just like Jesus said to Martha and Mary, that remember Martha and Mary said to him, yes, I know that he will rise in the last day. But Jesus said to his disciples before he went there, we have to go now because Lazarus, Lazarus is what? Sleeping. And then they didn't understand if he's sleeping, why are we going to go there? You know, and so he had to say, the Okay. So he said, guys, we have to go there because he's dead. So he's telling them that death is like sleeping. It's a beautiful thing, thinking about it. Imagine if someone died and goes straight to heaven, and then people think, you know, what, they're watching us, so we have to be behaving really well and all that. But God is always watching us. And so the angels, and the angels are writing what we're doing, right or wrong. It's not Santa Claus. Santa Claus is not watching us. He doesn't know if doesn't even know who is naughty or nice. Only God. Only Jesus Christ. Okay, so Daniel also predicted that Jesus will bring to life those who are sleeping. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and to shame and everlasting contempt. So there's two resurrections here. Which one is the first one? The ones who will have eternal life. Those who have been saved. The book of Revelation said. Those who have been written. The names has been written in the book of life. Those who have washed their robes. With the blood of the Lamb. Alright. So. That's the first one. And the second one is after the thousand years. Is that clear? It's, in, it's actually in Revelation 19 and 20. You can go and read it for yourself. If you don't believe that. Okay, the Bible says that when after the thousand years, Jesus will bring the holy city to the earth and he will resurrect the wicked and the wicked will try to take over 
the holy city, Satan will deceive. The Bible says that Satan will go and deceive all the nations again. Last time. And what's going to happen? What comes out of... They will be judged. Because in, those, in that thousand years, we're going to be looking at the books. It's like God is on trial for a thousand years. For all the people that didn't make it. We will be looking. Why my parents are not here? Or why my cousin is not here? So you will be looking in the books. Why? Because the saves lives, all the bad things that we did are not written anymore because they've been washed out. The Lord says in Jeremiah that he will never remember anymore our sins when we ask. Remember that when we sorrow, he will never remember our sins. So let's see. And he will be say in the days, in that day, behold, this is our God, we have waited for him and we, sorry, and he will save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. We will be glad and rejoice in his salvation. Do you, do you want to be part of that group? I can't hear you. I'm going to ask you again. You guys have been really quiet today. Okay. I want to ask you again. Do you want to be part of this group? Do you know that if you want to be part of this group, you will have eternal life? Not that it's in you. God will give it to us. But even when we live through eternity, the eternal life only belongs to God. The only person that is eternal is God. But we will be, according to the book of Revelation, we will be eating from the tree of life. What a beautiful privilege. Isaiah predicted that Jesus will create a new heaven and a new earth. When I was reading these Bible verses, it's like reading the book of Revelation. Look at this. For behold, I create a new heavens and a new earth. And the former shall not be remembered or come to mind. In the next verse it says, For as the new heaven and the new earth, which I will make, shall remain before me, says the Lord. So shall your descendants and your name remain. What a beautiful promise. I want to be in that group. In 66, Isaiah 66, and it shall come to pass that from one moon, which is in the, old, in, in, in the Hebrew is one month to another, and from one Sabbath to another. What, what day is the Sabbath? Saturday to us. Yes, the seventh day. All flesh shall come to worship before me, says the Lord. Jesus is coming soon. Now the question is. Are you ready to meet him? I want to hear you. Yes. Are you ready to meet him? Yes. If you accepted the Lord. Okay. If you accepted Jesus Christ into your heart. You are saved right there. And then repentance comes into your heart. The Holy Spirit comes in and shows you what's wrong in your life. Then by spending time with the Lord, you one day, you will be living eternally. Why? Because of the blood of Jesus Christ. Remember, the Father doesn't see us. We have a lawyer. We have a much better lawyer than, than Andrews. Trust me. Jesus Christ, he stands before the Father and he's, he showed his blood to the Father and he see him perfect. He, the Father, see Jesus Christ perfect and behind were all of us. But to the Father, we look perfect because of Christ. So why are you waiting? If you never accepted Jesus Christ into your heart, what? Why are you waiting? This is a beautiful promise. Jesus Christ wants to come into all of us. To the children. To the adults. To the young people. To the grandparents. And he wants to have a relationship with us. God is a personal God. He's not, he's not one of those gods that the, um, the Greeks you know, portray by... Um, People are like one big man there with a long beard and, and throwing linings to people when they're, when, they're, um, when they were wicked or, you know. 
they practice evil. God is not like that. Even in the Garden of Eden, do you remember how God presented himself to Adam and Eve after they sinned? Did he make a big lightning? Big thunder? Do you remember that? The only time we hear thunder and lightning is when he was in the mountains showing himself to the Israelites in Mount Sinai. But when, when he went to see Adam and Eve, he went like this. Listen. Adam, Eve, where are you? Like that. He doesn't come. Adam, Eve, where are you? No. God is a God of love. We need to understand that. God is a God of love. And he comes like a, you know, loving parent to the little children. Adam, Eve, where are you? Now, I don't know all of your names. But imagine the Lord calling your name today. Peter, where are you? Mary. Maria, if you're from the Philippines. Jose. Darío. Where are you? Rosa, where are you? Rose. Where are you? That's beautiful. The Lord, remember, the Lord sent his son not to judge us. He came to save you. He came to save me. So that we can live with him forever. Do you want to be part of the group? I want. I want to be part of the group. I want to be with my, my whole family there. I wish that was my family. Right there. It's a beautiful picture that speaks louder than words. Let's see John 14, 1 to 3. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my father's house are many mansions. If you were not, sorry, I would have told you. I go to prepare a what? A place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, look at this. I will come again. I'm going to read it loud again. I will come again. That's a beautiful promise. Second coming. And receive you to myself. That where I am, there you may be also. Beautiful words. I want you to go home today or after lunch, after you hear the concert. Hopefully you're not leaving. Okay? I want you to take these words. I will come again. Jesus is coming soon. All the messianic prophecies have been fulfilled. 2,000 years ago when Christ came as a child. And then he showed how to love, how to heal, how to live righteous. He died on the cross. He resurrected. And a group of young men went all around the world to proclaim the good news, which we call it today, the gospel. And it's up to you now to receive him. The Holy Spirit will be poured out one more time. But you need to ask for it. The disciples were in a house, praying, confessing the sins, and also for forgiving one another. If they, you know, if they, um, what's the word? If they offended someone, you know, they ask for forgiveness. They ask the Lord for forgiveness. And when everybody was in one accord, which is us, they were in one accord, the Lord sent his Holy Spirit. And the gospel went through the whole world. You can read it in one of the letters of Paul. It says that all the disciples went all around the world where they needed to be. We need to do this job where we live. Frankston, Mornington, Melbourne, wherever we go. Family, friends. If Jesus is not here yet, it's because we're not doing that job. We need to preach the word. We need to preach. Use Facebook. Use YouTube. Send the link to someone. If you, some, there was something there that really touched you, use Facebook. Share Bible verses with people. And tell them that the Lord is coming 
soon. Okay, this is the last song that we're going to do one accord. Father Along. This is one of my favorite songs because it's about the second coming. I hope that you can be this afternoon with us. And if you have to go home, I just pray that you will take Jesus with you today. And those beautiful, beautiful prophecies, they were fulfilling Jesus Christ. But now we have the hope that he will come soon. and pray dear Lord thank you for this beautiful beautiful Sabbath day thank you that you love us so much also thank you for the visitors 
and friends that are all here today listening to these beautiful words that you prepare for us through the scriptures. Thank you for the hope that we have. Because of the other prophecies have been fulfilled, we know that the rest will be fulfilled in the near future. Please help us to believe every day, to remember those words every day, so that we can tell others, so that we can help others to get to know you. And also bless our children, bless our friends, bless our families, and bless this church, so that your Holy Spirit can work every day and prepare the church for your coming. Help each one of us to understand your love and how soon the time for your coming is. Help us to understand that without you, we can't do nothing. That but with you, we can do anything. And please help us so through you, we can take this gospel to the world. And once and for all, wait for your second coming with love, with hope. Please help us to understand these beautiful prophecies. Help us so that we can believe in them with all our heart. We can understand that but sometimes our actions don't allow our belief to work through. Give us the faith that we need to go through tri tribulations, to go through troubles, and be with us until your coming. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Amen. Amen.